Good evening. I'm Dr. Paul Thierman. I'm director of the Academy Library and Center for the History of Medicine and Public Health. On behalf of my co-organizer, Dr. Robert J. Rubin, I warmly welcome you to the, our event, Then and Now, the Past and Future of Medical Libraries. We're very glad you've decided to join us this evening. And before I, I turn to our panelists, I wanted to give you a short introduction to the Academy and its Then and Now series. The New York Academy of Medicine was founded in 1847, 175 years ago. Today, NIAM is happy to take on the mantle of champions for health equity, tackling the barriers that prevent everyone from living a healthy life. The Academy Library dates from the very beginning of NIAM. We have since grown into one of the most significant collections in the history of medicine and public health in the country. We invite you to connect with us both digitally and in person. I especially invite you to check out our new interactive timeline on the library's history and our latest virtual visit on that same topic, both found on our website. As part of our 175th anniversary celebrations, the Academy Library is taking the lead in organizing events around the theme then and now, using the insights of history to shed light on issues in medicine and public health, where the Academy has done and is doing significant work. Tonight is the third such then and now event. Join us again on Tuesday, November 15th for our final offering of the year, the opportunities and challenges of healthy aging. In an event series on medicine and public health, why are we focusing on, the li on libraries? In fact, the NIAM Library is one of the great movers of medicine and public health in the city and in the nation. Tonight, we'll hear from three panelists. Arlene Shainer, NIAM's historical collections librarian, will speak on the development of our collections. Historian of Medicine, Bert Hansen, Emeritus Professor of History at Baruch College, will speak on how libraries shaped the development of medicine through history. Director of the Yale Medical Historical Library, Melissa Graff, will consider the future of historical collections such as ours. Our panelists will share their experiences and insights on the role of libraries in medicine and in history, and I very much look forward to hearing what they have to say. You can share your perspectives too, as well as your questions in the chat section of Zoom, which we'll turn to in the last part of the program. I also acknowledge the support of the Liliana Souter Lecture Fund and of my co-host, Bob Rubin, in the mounting of this program. I now pass the podium to Bob, Chair of the Fellows Section of the History of Medicine and Public Health at the New York Academy of Medicine. Thank you very much, Paul. It is a privilege and a pleasure to welcome all on behalf of the fellows of the section of History of Medicine and Public Health at the New York Academy of Medicine. The New York Academy of Medicine's library has been, is, and continues to be the quintessential source for the materials, books, periodicals, documents, images, and so much more, which is necessary to, for the pursuit of history of medicine and all of its ramifications. We utilize the library's many resources to further our understanding of where we came from and to aid us in understanding where we are and may be going. All this is marvelously facilitated by the librarians' encyclopedic knowledge of the collections and the understanding of the needs of the scholarly researcher. This vital and unique position is fulfilled by Arlene Shana. New York Academy of Medicine's Historical Collection Librarian, I now with pleasure and admiration give the podium to Arlene Shainer. Arlene. Thank you so much for that introduction, Bob. I'm gonna share my screen. And um, here we go so that we can get started. I am so happy to have the opportunity to talk about the library at the New York Academy of Medicine and how it evolved to become one of the best history of medicine collections in the United States. We have over 550,000 volumes, hundreds of thousands of pamphlets, archives, manuscripts, image collections, and even a small group of artifacts. I wanna spend just a minute though, explaining why I chose to call this talk a rich storehouse. 
My title comes from this book, printed in 1596 in London, one of several editions that we own, and it's shelved now with some of our most important books in the vault. But as you can see, when it was printed, it wasn't a fancy or expensive volume, and it was pitched to a much more modest audience. Its value, for many reasons, has changed over time. And the same holds true for lots of other materials here. Our library is a rich storehouse. And while plenty of obvious treasures are on the shelves, I would argue that it's really the entire library as an organic whole, much greater than the sum of its parts, that makes it so valuable and useful. And that the dedication of many people who made sure that unneeded volumes that started out here found their way into other libraries around the world also continues to have a lasting and less well-known impact. When Isaac Wood brought his set of Martin Payne's commentaries to the second meeting of the New York Academy of Medicine's library on January 13th, 1847, and suggested that the new organization begin assembling a library, what he and the early fellows mostly had in mind was a working collection of books and journals that the fellows would be able to consult themselves for professional reasons. Since the Academy had no home of its own, the librarian who was just a fellow, um, kept the books in his house or office. As we can see from the description of his job in the first constitution and bylaws on the right side of the screen there, he was responsible for anything anyone chose to donate. We don't really know how the first librarians kept track of the collection, and by 1874, it only had about 400 volumes, mostly donations from fellows, where serials acquired when the Academy exchanged copies of its own transactions for similar, similar publications produced by other organizations. We also don't really know anything about how the library was used during those first few decades, since looking at anything would have required arranging a visit to the home of the librarian himself. The purchase of a brownstone on West 31st Street in 1875 provided two rooms for the library, and that's the brownstone on the left of the screen. Dr. Samuel Smith Purple, who had just been elected president, had already promised to donate more than 2,000 books and journals from his own collection, along with a comparable number of pamphlets. And on the right side of the screen is the library reading room from that building. Once it had a home, the Academy also officially established a library committee in 1875, partly as a way of finally imposing some standardization on the way the collection would be managed and used. And one of the ways to do that was to start recording the holdings in accession books, which they did a couple of years later. And this is the first page of the first accession book. You can see all the entries are for journal volumes that were given by Samuel Purple. Other fellows donated or bequeathed their libraries to the Academy or left funds for purchasing books. And in 1878, they also voted to make the library available to anyone who wished to use it. It was then and still is the only medical library in the city of New York that anyone can use. Growth was swift. And by 1879, the library contained almost 10,000 volumes and was desperately in need of additional space. A building addition provided some temporary relief. And here we can see the new Dubois Hall with the balcony above that contained library stacks. Um, and then on the left is the library committee's kind of mandate from the, the, um, the bylaws. So the merger of the Academy with the Medical Library and Journal Association of New York in 1880 almost immediately set the library on the path to overcrowding yet again, and the hunt for new and larger quarters began in earnest. On October 2nd, 1890, the Academy held its first meeting in its just completed new home on the west side of 43rd Street near Fifth Avenue, and you can see that building on the left with more generous library spaces that were also fireproof. And here on the right is the reading room from that building. And then a view of the stack areas on the left and the periodicals room on the right. All these changes opened the door to what librarian Janet Doe later referred to as a snowball of gifts, which has rolled down through the years, gathering momentum and throwing off new snowballs that roll into other libraries. The first of these snowballs arrived in 1898 when the Society for the New York Hospital decided to close its library and sent 23,000 books to the Academy. 
And this is when rare books really begin to be part of the library's collection. Significant portions of this gift were John Watson's medical rare book collection, David Hussick's botanical books, and 123 works, mainly on chemical and alchemical topics, from the library of John Winthrop the Younger, who had been a colonial governor of Connecticut, and his descendants. Not all 23,000 books stayed at the Academy, though. Duplicates were shared with 21 other local libraries and institutions. The collection grew so quickly during the 35 years that the Academy was on West 43rd Street that by 1910, not only had the organization purchased the brownstone next door for extra space, but it also purchased the building directly behind on West 44th Street, partly for the storage of volumes that would never be added to the collections. Duplicates and even triplicates posed a special challenge in terms of storage and because the Academy wanted to ensure that these books found new homes where they would be put to good use. In 1920, for example, a significant number of these books made their way to the Columbia University Medical School Library. By the early 1920s, the Academy was desperate again for new space, and generous grants from the Carnegie Corporation and the Rockefeller Foundation helped provide the funds to build our current building, which opened in 1926. 140,000 volumes made their way across Central Park in November of that year under the supervision of the newly appointed librarian, Dr. Archibald Malik. And here we can see the magisterial third floor reading room in 1926 when the building opened, the periodicals room before the, uh, the balcony was ever added, and the reference lobby from the space, um, which still exists today, but is set up a little bit differently. So, Archie Malik came to the library with a strong and well-documented interest in the history of medicine, and his appointment as librarian was followed almost immediately by the election of Samuel Lambert, a bibliophile himself, as president. And in 1928, when Philadelphia bookseller A.S.W. Rosenbach approached the library about purchasing Edward Clark Streeter's collection of medical high spots, it took only a few months for the Academy to raise the needed funds. The Streeter collection brought about 1,200 rare books into the library, including the beautiful illuminated manuscript copy of Guy de Choliac's Great Surgery, shown here on the right, and 183 in Canabula. Just a year later, Margaret Barkley Wilson, a fellow with a special interest in the intersection of nutrition, cookery, and health, gave the Academy her collection of almost 10,000 manuscripts, books, pamphlets, and menus about foods and cooking. The star of her collection, a 9th century manuscript copy of Apicius de Re Culinaria, penned at the monastery at Fulda, is shown on the right. More than anything else, Dr. Malik, and he is on the left here, wanted a rare book and history room for this swiftly growing part of the library and the reference works needed to support it. The generosity of Edward S. Harkness and other donors made that possible, and the new spaces opened for use in 1933. Malik also hired two stellar librarians in the 1920s, Janet Doe, who's on the right here, and Gertrude Annan on the left. Doe became the librarian after he retired in 1950, and Annan succeeded her six years later. Their impact on the collections cannot be overstated. Like Malik, both Doe and Annan served as presidents of the Medical Library Association, were committed to expanding the current collections, and were also seriously interested in the history of medicine. At the end of 1948, the library received what was and remains the greatest single gift in its history, the Edwin Smith Surgical Papyrus, which was jointly presented by the New York Historical Society and the Brooklyn Museum. Although it is currently not on site, the papyrus has been digitized and it continues to generate more interest than any other item in our collections. In 1949, the New York Public Library sent 20,000 books to the library, many of them rare books, but some of them duplicates. For decades, the two libraries had had a semi-formal agreement that the public library would refer researchers interested in medicine to NIAM, while NYPL concentrated on adding more purely scientific materials. Our library kept 8,000 of the donated volumes, but the other 12,000 were sent to Dallas, where the Southwestern Medical College had recently been established. At the same time, 
The library also sent almost 30,000 volumes of duplicates to the medical school of the University of Chile, which had been almost completely destroyed by fire the year before. Right around the same moment, so the late 40s, many thousands of additional duplicate books and monographs, so journals and, and monographs mostly, were sent to libraries in countries including China, Poland, the Netherlands, and Czechoslovakia that had been badly damaged during the Second World War. In 1946, a group of fellows with a serious interest in the history of medicine formed the Friends of the Rare Book Room, and the next three decades witnessed a period of astonishing generosity on their part. Some of them made steady small gifts of books or manuscripts to the library, while others left more, left lar much larger collections. And I'm just going to mention a couple of these in passing. So Fenwick Beekman's collection of books by and about John Hunter, and that's Hunter on the left here. Rufus Cole's collection of books by the 18th century physician and naturalist Francesco Redi and his intellectual circle, the Academia del Cimento. Robert Levy's collection of works by and about William Harvey and his more general cardiology books. And so there's Levy's book plate. William Ladd's collection of images, most of them portraits, but some of them of institutions or events. And there's a Ladd collection image on the right. The Healy collection of printed images about a wide range of medical topics, mainly from Harper's Weekly and Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper. And Ernst Harm's collection of books on psychiatry, deliberately chosen by him because Niam did not have them already. I've not even touched on our archival collections, which are especially strong in documenting the history of New York medicine as it professionalized during the 19th and 20th centuries. All kinds of medical societies, both small and large, found a home for their records here. And our own archives provide a wealth of information documenting NIAM's own activities. More recent editions, such as the papers of the New York hand surgeon J. William Littler, and you can see an image from the Littler collection on the right, and Walter Bingham's patent medicine almanacs and trade carts have enriched the archives but await processing, making them more challenging for researchers to consult. And what about the library and the way that it's used now? The rare books and special collections do get used, but requests for other materials have jumped. And I'm circling back here to what I expressed right at the beginning of this talk, that image of the library as a rich storehouse of materials where value just keeps shifting over time. The library's periodical collections continue to be extraordinary, even though we no longer subscribe to any current clinical medical journals with runs of serials from countries around the world. Despite the ever increasing availability of digital surrogates, copyright restrictions mean that both remote and in-person researchers are always asking for journals, some of which can be found in very few other institutions. Even people with access to academic libraries that subscribe to lots of e-journals find themselves stuck when decades of a journal have yet to be digitized and aren't accessible either through the publishers or through collaborative projects like the Heidi Trust, or when content like letters to the editor or advertisements is not part of the electronic version. Some of these issues also hold true for much of our 20th century monograph collection. The many pamphlet and ephemera collections are heavily used as well. NIAM has been collecting pamphlets almost from the beginning. We have several hundred thousand. And while many of them can be found in our printed catalog, the majority of the pamphlets that were added before the last quarter of the 20th century remain undiscoverable in the OPAC. In 1999, Niam also launched the Gray Literature Report, which was discontinued at the end of 2016. All that content was harvested online, but for years, the library made a practice of printing out every cataloged item. Now those printed documents are sometimes the only record of a report that long ago disappeared from the digital universe because the organization that produced it no longer exists or removed the content.
we do have some digital collections of our own, and we collaborate with both for profit companies and open access projects to make more of the collections visible and available online. But we have many challenges ahead. Those are really part of a different conversation. We continue to think hard about how we can address the role of the library in the future while still respecting the past. And with that, I am going to turn the screen over now to Bert Hansen, whose presentation will look more at the way that NIAMS Library has contributed to the wider world of American medicine over time. Thank you. And I just need to get back to my Zoom screen here um, or get somebody to stop sharing for me because this is my ongoing problem of not being able to get the Zoom screen to show up again. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm unmuted, I'm sharing, new share. This is, uh, they all look alike now. Uh, you can hear me, let me see if I can advance this. I can't get advanced, I have to get to, uh, let me uh, get out of full screen. Can I get out of full screen? No. So I'm going to stop that share and I'm going to start sharing again uh, PowerPoint slide. I think this is the right one. Okay, yes. Um, start from the beginning. Okay, I think we're all right. Uh, hope you can hear me okay. And thank you, Arlene. Sorry for the, the clumsiness here. Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, I've been invited to offer some reflections about the library's contributions to American medicine beyond the metropolitan area, the wider question. For the medical humanities, I know some of the story firsthand, but the evidence is limited for physicians in practice and medical researchers and how they might have used it. Um, okay, good, all right. Unfortunately for historians, people rarely document exactly how they have used the library. Histories of libraries, in fact, omit users generally, and they focus instead on leadership, buildings, classification systems, stewardship, and service delivery. Uh, okay. Arguments talk has shown us cultural treasures and human dimensions of the Academy Library. I hope to illustrate how the social and material context shaped the user experience over the last 200 years especially for people outside of the city. I use grandiose names uh, to highlight technology as the key variable. As you can see, I think of the railroad era, the auto era, the airplane era, and the change, the digital information era uh, more recently. During the 19th century, American medical libraries served a small elite. Among the earliest was Pennsylvania Hospital. If you go there today, you can still visit the elegant room used for the library since 1807. It's like a time machine ride back over 200 years. During this first era, transport and communication technologies limited the offsite impact for any library. But changes appeared near the end of the century when John Shaw Billings at the Surgeon General's Library embarked in 1874 on a revolutionary new bibliographic venture called the Index Catalog of the Library. His initial series took 21 years to get from A to Z in 16 volumes, but it showed that an analytical list of books and periodicals held at a specific location can still be of great use even to people who never get to that location. Such a list, for example, allowed a person to discover the existence of publications on a subject or by a particular author as a step toward acquiring them. 
from a bookseller or finding them in a collection closer to home. And having a full record of each item could correct incomplete citations found elsewhere. Such benefits of a holdings list are still valuable today and will remain so into the future. The Academy Library soon followed the index catalog model, and in 1889, they published a book of its holdings for English language serials. Now, during the early 20th century, all the health professions exploded in numbers and in scientific knowledge. Medical libraries likewise grew in size and importance, as Arlene showed. In the mid-1920s, the Academy moved into the impressive new uptown building, and in 1933, as she mentioned, an addition to that building made space for the elegant rare book room we still enjoy today. With the automobile and public transit, more people could be served at the Academy's large uptown location. Significantly, physicians in this era still depended on face-to-face -face interaction for their continuing education lectures and socializing at banquets and award ceremonies. Large-scale meetings in faraway hotels with colleagues in the same subspecialty had not yet become common. Rather, in-person gatherings at the Academy building meant that the library was visibly present for hands-on use in the same building. Physical proximity and direct use meant that devoting a share of membership dues to the library made sense to everyone in this era. And by the 1920s, NIAM was also doing more public outreach in such areas as disease prevention, popular information, including radio broadcasts, public health research, and publications for professionals with historical interests. These clearly were aimed to benefit non-members and a wider off-site audience, whether locally, nationally, or even internationally. And the library played a key role in such academy initiatives. For a quick glance at a few of those many efforts, I start with a library exhibit celebrating Louis Pasteur's 100th birthday in 1922, since this year we honor his 200th. The rich exhibit of artifacts, manuscripts, and printed materials at the Nyan Library was flagged as significant by a full article in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal that described many pieces individually and other accounts that appeared in the New and other accounts appeared in the New York Times and several medical and scientific journals. Over the next decade, Nyan played an important collaborative role with other institutions in a landmark empirical study, very famous one, Maternal Mortality in New York City. That was 1933. Further evidence of their efforts at public outreach in this era was a magazine they were publishing, Health Examiner. And the fact that the popular and indefatigable Dr. Iago Goldston worked as secretary of NIAM's Medical Information Bureau, a position he took in 1928 and held for 34 years. The Information Bureau initiated radio broadcasts, the new medium, for a wider audience. Some were called lectures to the la laity and others were called for doctors only, though anyone could listen. 40 popular lectures from the 1950s are now available through the NIAM website. Starting in the 1930, in 1930, the library also established a history of medicine book series with an edition of Frock Astoria's book on contagion. This was soon followed by others and then, as I show here, a 300-page bibliography of the works of Ambrose Poiré. It's not 300 pages of works about him, just his own works, a 300-page collection, uh, by the Academy's librarian, Janet Dole, who you met, Dole, who you met a few minutes ago. You can also listen, if you're curious, to Janet Dole speaking in 1951 about the services provided by the Academy Library. She emphasized the reference librarians work in responding to requests submitted by telephone and by mail. And she invited listeners to send in theirs. Now, some also other key contributions to American medicine made by the NIAM Library were Janet Dole's work to strengthen the profession of medical librarians and support legislation, which in time established our National Library of Medicine. And as I wrap up this second era, I want to highlight another remarkable achievement of the Academy Library. The librarians created index cards for separate catalogs, one of biographies, one of illustrations, and of portraits. 
These labor intensive operations demanded a high level of professional knowledge. And they provide a transition into our third area when a new genre of reference books will make accessible to users anywhere some of the unique resources housed in the library. The growth of air travel after mid-century affected medical libraries in several ways. Uh, and that's the National Library of Medicine on top with its uh, spaceship roof, part of, on the roof, and it's the TWA in, in New York. Um, travel to professional meetings brought new face-to-face -face connections with out-of-town colleagues. And doctors gradually became more loyal to colleagues who shared a medical specialty rather than to colleagues who shared the residential location in the city. Such changes undercut the basis for local medical academies and societies. The meaning of membership was altered. And over time, that could reduce members' financial and moral support for library collections. Although NIAM and its historical library have fortunately survived through this transition, some locality-based institutions have not. But I shouldn't draw, jump ahead in my story. Back at mid-century, the NIAM library substantially expanded its outreach with a new kind of reference work. In the 1960s, it was the publisher G.K. Hall who worked with unusually strong collections like Nyan and published large sets of oversized volumes using photographs of traditional catalog cards. Uh, those volumes with 21 cards on a page, and I'll show a page in a minute, and about 700 pages in a volume, even large catalogs could be reproduced and sets could be owned by a library anywhere. As a measure of scale, the subject catalog for Nyan just the subject catalog, published in 1969, had 34 volumes. You see some of them on the right there. Not 34, not counting supplements, for a total of about a half million cards, all cataloged by hand, some in handwriting, some in typing. Photographing the cards, instead of typesetting the texts, along with new automated printing technology, made such publications economically feasible. Helpfully too, the images preserve layouts, fonts, and the handwritten entries. I personally used these volumes during graduate school and my early years of teaching outside of New York City in the 1970s and 80s. These nine volumes often helped me discover items which I might then find locally or order on microfilm. Despite the book's cumbersome size, making them hard to handle and impossible to photocopy, I am still nostalgic about access to the new information I found on the cards in these volumes. These sets clearly serve researchers and librarians working far distant from the Academy's building. Besides the traditional author and subject catalogs seen here in green and blue bindings, the library's unique catalogs of biographies, illustrations, and portraits also appeared in the GK Hall books. Note that in cataloging images, I think you can see enough detail, the near librarian, Nyan librarians, weren't making cards only for separate prints, but for images inside of bound books and journals. I would guess that this set was especially helpful to graphic artists, book illustrators, and the news media. Without such a catalog to guide a researcher, there's no way a library patron could efficiently search for books in the stacks, hoping to find images of goiters, medical museums, or artificial legs. Near the end of this third era, Computerized records of holdings were introduced in libraries, first for the administration and later in the reading room. These MARC records for machine readable catalog were at first limited to the home library, but in time they could be shared library to another. Since this is our own era, uh, some of you may remember using these monochrome screens of an online public access catalog or OPAC that you called up by dialing in through Telnet. Despite being cumbersome, OPACs offered a fabulous new level of access and convenience. And in the next era, access would come, as we use it, through internet connection to web-based records using more friendly HTML design. Nowadays, we can browse the holdings of far more collections than the few libraries whose printed catalogs had been available in reference rooms. Daily from our homes and offices, we search general and specialized collections based anywhere in the world. But even more generous than sharing catalog records are the recent digitization projects of library holdings, 
from many libraries, including the Academy, freely available to all users through the internet. The Academy Library currently has 18 digital collections on their website. Beautiful and fascinating. Not just data dumps of scanned images, each is professionally curated with ancillary information. Among those I personally use are the Carte de Visite collection, the Mass collection of hospital postcards, and the live collection of prints. But also, don't miss the one on the Resurrectionists or the 40 audio recordings of radio lectures that I mentioned. Such curated collections and even simple PDFs of book scans and photographs take a significant time and skills of professional librarians, curators, and tech specialists. While internet users access them for free, posting them is not free or even cheap for libraries. Digitizing some holdings might in time offer modest fiscal savings and reduce staff for reading rooms and book pages. Yet these generous new projects cannot possibly pay their own way on a library's budget. Every day I'm grateful that so many institutions are generously posting works I can use at home without travel to the collections. But I worry that the goodwill and the scholarly productivity which is being generated for unknown users around the world by these digital collections might not sustain funding for specific libraries, which are inherently cost centers and they cannot become revenue centers and still serve the world of learning. In universities, tuition helps pay for professors and librarians, but no user is being asked to pay tuition or fees for the catalogs and digital files that independent libraries are generously sharing with all of us. I also worry that with patrons doing searches from home or office, we risk losing the knowledge, the skills, and wisdom of devoted librarians, individuals with whom I have enjoyed working for nearly six decades. I hope I might be wrong in predicting this kind of loss, even as I benefit daily from the remote access to catalogs and scans. I want to close by noting that even in the digital age, much of the medicine we study can be experienced best by examining the books and images in person rather than as pixels on a screen. The Academy Library has been affording everyone that kind of access for well over a century, and my students and I have personally been doing that in the Kohler Rare Book Room for over 50 of those years. Now our next speaker will help us see what might be on the horizon. Please welcome Dr. Melissa Graff from Yale as I turn the screen over to her. Thank you all. Good evening, everyone. And thank you to Arlene and Bert um, for their presentation on the collection's rich history. I turn now to my now and future uh, discussion, a play on the larger then and now series that this panel is part of tonight. So I am, I'm gonna start this by saying, I am not a fortune teller, um, but I have some ideas concerning the future of medical libraries. I'm gonna go swiftly through two key technological trends in medicine as I consider the future of medical libraries and historical collections like the one at NIAM. As someone charged with helping to connect the world to Yale's historical collection and to preserve the collection for future generations, I am deeply inter interested in the interplay between medicine and libraries. The first trend, um, which will continue to dominate the, uh, the future of medicine, um, concerns the sheer amount of data produced in medical research, clinical work, and other aspects of the field. The data itself, um, if if you're you know follow some of these trends, um, there is an increasing push to open data produced in medical research and clinical trials more broadly. And in fact, there are some government initiatives around this. Um, I feel that data is going to become and can uh, this overwhelming wave of material unless we can find ways to corral it to curate it and to make it more permanently accessible in the future. As Arlene was talking about some of the gray literature that disappeared in the past, I sometimes have these worries related to data uh, in the future because the, the amount needed, um, the, the preservation needed to, to keep data accessible 
and just trying to understand what's out there is is just again something that I think is uh, going to be uh, something that medical libraries will deeply dive into and can and and uh, think about as 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 we move forward. So again, one aspect that I see um, is is the uh, curation of data and libraries' way of preserving it and managing it in the future. The second future trend that uh, you know we're seeing seeing even today relates to artificial intelligence, and artificial intelligence intelligence draws on the analysis of often large amounts of information of data in order to find connections and draw conclusions. Um, it can search for information. It can you know now detect medical conditions. It can you know create connections. Um, across of a wide spread of data, it can interpret languages. It can create books. It can, um, sorry, it, it can you know uh, create art at this point. Um, and I see artificial intelligence and in, in medicine more broadly as a tool for healthcare providers. Um, but it's also a, a tool for sifting through these mountains of data that I mentioned. And um, when it comes to artificial intelligence and libraries, I, I see artificial intelligence as a, a tool that medical libraries will use as a way of helping, um, helping researchers, helping clinicians. I still think that the role of the library, the role of the library will be critically important in helping to implement these tools and that these tools like artificial intelligence Will, will be alongside the normal roles that libraries continue to play um, in, in everyday in our everyday life. And you know, I, I will point out that libraries often follow medical trends, not surprisingly. Um, so this is a slide from the National Institutes of Health. I like this slide because it shows many different aspects of um, medicine that libraries are already deeply embedded in, whether it's, again, curating or preserving or sharing scientific data, whether it's looking at genomics and, and the data that is produced there. We provide access to research tools, whether it's the librarian who guides you through some of the resources to um, uh, tools that may help you develop systematic reviews to, you know, the, the physical places where the books are kept or the, the journals are kept. Um, the library is an a, a tool in the arsenal for, for medical practitioners. Um, I also want to point out, of course, on the slide, you'll see things like clinical trials and research publications. And again, libraries are always on top of these trends. We, we always, we could tie into the future. We're always part of what medicine does. And medicine follows larger society trends. And so really, we're just, we're just part of this larger technological wave that has been crashing through society since the late 20th century. So medicine is constantly building on the past from journal articles to the cre uh, creation of research projects. And questions like, who's researched this before? What was this drug used for previously? How did people handle past pandemics? Which was really relevant once COVID hit and researchers needed to find a reference point for, glo for a global pandemic, they turned to the 1918 flu. So medicine builds upon itself quite regularly. There are subtler ways that medicine is affected by the past um, from ways that health quote unquote standards are often based on white male bodies to disparities in healthcare stemming from slavery and other types of systemic racism. And I will say that um, as I am turning towards kind of rare medical collections and technology and medicine, that these rare medical collections carry the, the, the weight of all this history. They, they have this information that is constantly referred to in the medical literature today. And this is not gonna change in the future. This is still going to happen no matter what. Um, I like to point out that physical books and objects continue to resonate in the medical world often in dialogue and in juxtaposition with the millions of digitized materials most often used in research and teaching. 
Um, the libraries uh, are, you know, libraries have digitized millions of books that unlock past medical practices, providing opportunities for people worldwide to examine many aspects of medicine. Sometimes it takes the physical book or object in conjunction with the digitized version to learn things you can't understand online. I will cycle back to this point in a, in a few moments. I wanted to share this quote, which is part of um, a study that I was, um, I did uh, on behalf of Yale uh, right before COVID. And in this uh, study, which uh, was produced by Ithaca, we were looking at the role of primary source collections, physical books, other kinds of objects in, in teaching. And there's, this quote just continues to haunt me where one of our instructors said, we're at a moment where the desire for a tangible haptic encounter with something is understood to be an antidote to something that is perceived to be unhealthy in our society, which is the extent to which we reside in the digital sphere. And I, I think this is, incredibly important um, because as we continue with larger technological trends, as we engage in virtual reality, as we, um, as we have to, as we stick with our phones and our computers regularly, sometimes there are moments where we really do need to think about the physical collections. And sometimes we need that, that interaction with something, a, a, you know, a book, a, an object, um, to help us break away, I think, from the overwhelmingly technological world that we live in. So let's think beyond 175 years. Now, I really cannot answer the question of, of what's going into, you know, what the future of NIAM's library is. I leave that to NIAM. I leave it to the incoming president. I leave it to the community to figure that out but I do have some thoughts. So I wanna point out what doesn't translate online. Um, I hope Arlene doesn't mind that I use this image. Uh, it was from, I think the most recent event related to the 175th anniversary. I love her standing there and uh, on the right uh, in front of the huge anatomical at atlas. I think that's albinus there. Um, and what this really shows is I could, I could digitize this work and make it available online, but in order to understand some of its uses, in order to really think, gosh, this is not a book that people are carrying around. This is this is a an extravagant work that one that she's showing in the picture. Um, you sometimes really do need to see the physical object. Similarly, I'm always surprised by what the collection has. Um, so, for example, uh, we see. Uh, Alexander Fleming's moldy medallion, which I wasn't aware of in the collection, but every time I visit that collection, you'll find something new. And again, having, you know, I see a picture here, it's one thing, but when I see the object in, in person and I, and I can handle it or I can look at it more deeply, I get a better understanding of its use, who, who made it, why they, they put it together, and what it tells me about medicine in a way that sometimes the physical collections, I mean, the online collections can't do. I also want to point out um, that NIAM's physical library is a huge trove of data on medicine, on health inequalities, and the human condition. Just because we haven't unlocked everything yet doesn't mean that the physical collection uh, doesn't have a massive uh, or a major use in the future. I cannot predict how physical books will interact with virtual reality or how um, uh, artificial intelligence will, will, will cycle into things like our um, physical collections. But again, we never thought that digitized collections would, would ever be a thing for physical libraries. And yet dig digitized collections have unlocked so much for users and researchers worldwide, where people like Bert and myself can go to our computer and find so many different things. And keep in mind that what's online is only a fraction of what's actually embedded in the physical collection. So there's tons of data to find, to mine, to, to examine, to think about in the physical collections that I think we just need to, 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 to imagine and, 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 and inspire and, and develop partnerships so that, again, I can't predict the future, but I think these physical collections 
will be made accessible in another generation, in another different, you know, another iteration, sorry, not generation, iteration in another way. Um, and I, I think we're just waiting for another moment to see that change. Um, but the physical collections are, are, are still the heart and soul, not only of the New York Academy of Medicine, but places like Yale as well. So I am going to end with um, with this with this shot. Um, as Arlene and Bert described, NIAM's library staff and collections more throughout the centuries, adapting to trends in medicine and library field. From seeding other medical library collections to creating online resources for worldwide use, the influence of NIAM's library spreads far beyond its physical walls. I end the talk today with this image from the library's website, working to safeguard the heritage of medicine to inform the future of health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Arlene and Bert. That was a, a trio of great talks. <laughs> I am blown away. So before I, I have a few questions, but I wanted to see if, if uh, Bert or um, Arlene or or Melissa or Bob Rubin have questions for one another before I step in. I'll defer to the audience. <laughs> and I also invite people to uh, to to share their uh, to share their uh, questions and comments in the chat, please. A question to Melissa. Um, Looking at the, or let me phrase it a different way. You make a very good point that what has been digitalized is but the tip of the iceberg. Um, how to inform the public that services, that there's so much more hidden, there's so much more down there, not to be uh, so superficial. It's uh, like, uh, using cliff notes to pass your English exam in college. Read the book. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know at this point if, I, I have seen that people have turned increasingly to online resources and have ignored the, the physical resources that are not available online. I think part of it is on us to continue to find ways to make these materials accessible in as many different fashions as we can, whether it's online, whether it's in person, whether it's, I, you know, I, again, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by artificial intelligence. I'm intrigued by virtual reality. I don't know how this is gonna work, but um, I, I think it's more on the libraries and the institutions to really help people to, to push that material out there, to stop sitting on the collections um, not only for it, for preservation is important, but to to do more that we can to, to to do more to push it out, and I think that's on us really. I could be radical about this, so <laughs> why not? <laughs> Bert, a question to you. Um, yes. You intimated that uh, the half life of many of the historical libraries is relatively limited. Uh, are there any numbers to how many have been uh, shredded over the last time, have been closed? Uh, what, what is a, both a North American and a European and Asiatic uh, picture? I don't have uh, as concrete data on that. I think of the changes when uh, in the New York Academy of Sciences, which went through a big transition and got rid of its building and so on. Um, but also I think it's just, it's partly still going, but the question arises of who pays for what? And the rest of us have benefited yeah. from institutions. And as I say, with universities, there are other ways that pay for university resources, but with independent academies, it's the membership model gets more problematic over time as membership gets weaker in some ways for, for cultural and, and uh, uh, technological contextual reasons. So I think it's a, a something we have to be aware of as, as always a possibility. Let me go one step further then. Um, having had practical experience of getting things funded through the government and NIH, uh, does the consortium of historical libraries uh, 
have they actively begun to lobby Congress to either provide funds to NSF, uh, NIH, or probably some other uh, organizations within the government that I do not know, but that would be a logical place to go. And the money that you would ask for compared to a, even like the Cancer Institute is not, not even pocket change. I think, uh, if you don't mind me taking this one, Bert, I, I think that um, that there's a limited uh, amount of money that the government is willing to spend. Um, and I think there's been a move away from funding simply for digitization's sake. And a lot of the projects that we see today are actually projects in conjunction with the community. Does the community want to have not only NIAMS collection, but perhaps another collection within the community, maybe different sources within different families put, you know, put together. Like it's it's this move away from just these kind of larger institutions or even mid-tier institutions digitizing and a more a more holistic understanding of how to, to make resources available beyond the libraries itself, even if it's we've only digitized the tip of the iceberg. Um, so it's, and, and you may be giving libraries maybe more power than we actually have. So I, I will say also that for collections that that decline for whatever reason, as, as Bert has mentioned, just keep in mind that collections often get folded into other collections in various ways, yeah. right? It's not, it, it, and, and yes, we, there are collectors who have it. Yes, there is loss. That's the way history goes. But those those collections do see new lives in 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 in, in different ways, and I think um, Nyan's collection, the way they've seeded so many other collections, is a good example of that. I just want to actually hop in here a little bit too, because Bert, I think you gave a wonderful example with the New York Academy of Sciences, and it's an example about how you can make a decision that then you come to regret immediately, and then how are you going to fix it? which is that when the New York Academy of Sciences moved out of its building and went downtown, they threw out their library. And all of a sudden they realized that they had thrown out their own, the record of all of their own achievement. So the whole record of what they had published themselves, the Annals of the Lyceum um, of Natural History, going all the way forward through to the current publications. And how did they, they kind of reinvent that. Our copies of their publications actually went to them, um, which I have to say, you know, I have some regrets about losing the early stuff, the annals. Um, and the agreement was that when they digitized, especially the, the more recent stuff through Wiley, that we were going to have perpetual access to that. Um, has that happened? No. You know, it's a kind of constant tug of war to kind of get that access back. But, you know, the the kind of newest example of this or one of the newer examples of this is the release of the Boston Medical Library from the so, you know, Harvard has, has decided that they're not going to manage that library anymore. And they let it go. And they're struggling still to figure out now, okay, where is this gonna live? Who's gonna have access to it? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna service it? And big chunks of it are not accessible to anyone. So we all struggle with all of these challenges all the time. Um, and, uh, and there are no easy answers or good answers to anything. So I, and Melissa, I do wanna thank you for putting up that that photograph the, with the, the giant albinus, because it yes, is just right. like such a great reminder that, that nothing replaces the physical object. Yeah. Nothing replaces an encounter with a physical object, because you learn so many things from that. And, um, you know, I think we kind of all keep making that argument. And when people ex experience it themselves, they're just like, oh, right, now I know what you're talking about. Let me use that as an opportunity to, to pose one question to uh, the three panelists. Uh, uh, playing off of what Melissa said, what would, what would be an interesting encounter between the digital facsimile and the, and, and the actual book? Because I found, I, found, I found everyone's talk fascinating, but that's the one thing that, that really 
stood stood with me because I think that is the future. I think that the 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 creative encounter between the the digital world and the physical world. What take a moment? What do you think? We had um, just just recently. You know, I work with a lot of students, a lot of classes. And so um, in the class, they often show, you know, the, the professor will show slides and there's a the big blow up of the actual image. And, and so people are like, okay, yeah, I understand. I see the image, this is the history, this is whatever. And then recently we, we had some sessions where I pulled out the actual works and it was, it was one of those moments where they were just like, wow. <laughs> wow, just because, not only because of the, the um, that they could see the physical work, well, sometimes because they can handle the physical work and that again that's an opportunity that isn't often given and it should be given more in many different yes, ways. Yes. Um, but it, it just it it helped it helped to make some larger connections which wouldn't have made been made would, would have been obvious online with again use with with why people made choices about the the, the way they produced that item and the, that book or you know that book or that poster or whatever I think was, it, that that's a, a good a good example. Um, there's others, but that's that's one I had recently. Good. Okay. And, and when I work with students and objects like this, it's often with periodicals or popular magazines. Um, and part of it is saying, how heavy is this paper? Is this expensive paper, cheap paper? Uh -huh. How big is this? Would it have fit on the newsstand? Would it have drawn readers? Was it likely to be saved? Um, and things like that, which you lose on the digital copies. You know, a two by two engraving is as big as the 20 by 20 engraving. They're all the same visually. And we don't often don't photograph them with the scale. But even with if you have the size scale, you don't get, was this a precious object like we saw with the albinus that you can't open casually or carry around casually? Or was it for, for a different kind of use and, and so on? So that's what I try to open up. And it's not just about any specific object. It's opening up for people that question, the awareness that behind the pixels, there are physical realities that can vary and they may be interesting and relevant to the history of the object or the history of the image or the history of the text. Great. Thank you all. This has been a great evening. I have more questions than I have answers coming off of it, I have to say. Uh, so uh, I hope we have an opportunity to continue the discussion uh, as we go forward into wherever our digital and physical realms take us. So thank you all. And thanks everyone for coming, appreciate it. Thank you.